Alex Santiago Hiram, the Director of Education at New York Theatre Workshop, and we are so thrilled that you are with us this evening for a talk back um, uh, with a number of partner organizations uh, after uh, the streaming of Sanctuary City, uh, which I hope you've been able to see before tonight or even this evening. Um, before we get started and I introduce um, our guests and panelists today, um, like we do at every virtual event, um, an event at New York Theater Workshop, um, we would love to take a moment um, to honor the lands uh, where our work uh, resides in New York City. Uh, New York Theater Workshop has long sought to create art that interrogates our past um, uh, as a way of understanding the present. Hi, Rose. Welcome. We'll soon we'll soon bring everybody on. We'll soon bring everybody on. Uh, but glad to to finally have you here. Um, but uh, as I was saying, we are often um, in virtual spaces and still uh, in this moment of pandemic, still like to honor the native lands where we where we sit, where our work resides. Um, and uh, um, we are taking time to recognize the history of the land we occupy in the East Village. And as we find ourselves, as I was saying, in the digital space, we'd like to embrace the opportunity to acknowledge the many native lands from where you are all uh, tuning in. Um, so we uh, will post the link in the chat, um, but we're also invite you to post the lands um, you are on wherever you are right now. Um, New York Theater Workshop, as I said, is situated in the, uh, on the island of Manhattan, Manhattan, and we acknowledge the traditional lands of the Monsi Lenape, the Canarsi, the Onkachok, Matinecock, Shinnecock, Brickawonk, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, the conversation tonight will last um, with our panelists would last between 40 and 45 minutes, and then we will open it up at the end, the remaining time, um, 20 to 25, uh, 15 minutes, I should say, uh, for Q&A. Um, and we invite you to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to post your questions um, to our panelists. Um, uh, tonight's conversation is in partnership with Raices, uh, Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services in Texas, the Center for Migration in the Global City, uh, Rutgers Law School Center for Immigration Law, Justice and Social Policy, and Rutgers Law School Newark Immigrant Rights Clinic. Hope I got them all, all correctly. Okay, so are we ready? Um, first, I would love to welcome Martina Mayok, our playwright for Sanctuary City. There's Martina, yay! Um, welcome, Martina. Uh, Faisal Al-Jaburi, who is the Associate Vice President of Philanthropy at Raices. Um, um, Anju Gupta, who is uh, the Vice uh, Dean and Professor of Law uh, uh, and Director of the Immigrant uh, Rights Clinic at Rutgers Law School in Newark. Um, Team Raphael, who is Professor of Arts and Culture at Rutgers as well. And Rose, who, who you just saw, Kuisan, Bill I saw. Did I get it right, Rose? Probably not. Almost correct me if I'm wrong. Um, who is interim dean and professor of law, chancellor of social justice, um, and director of the Center for Immigration Law and Policy, Policy and Justice at Rutgers Law School. You all have great, fantastic titles. Welcome all to this wonderful conversation. Um, Martina, let's start with you, shall we? Oh no, okay. <laughs> You're the playwright, you're the reason. I know, I'm scary. <laughs> no, don't be scared at all. It's so great to see you again. Um, Martina, could you start by talking about uh, the inspiration for Sanctuary City? Um, some of your earlier work, Ironbound Queens, has uh, dealt into immigrant stories and the immigrant experience. And uh, I'm curious if you could share with our audience what was the, the, the spark um, the inspiration for this story um, and, and what you were attempting to, to do with this play uh, that you had not done with the, the previous pieces you had written. Before you start, um, well, I, yeah, it's like some of the, the plays that you mentioned, I tend to write about um, characters that have immigrant backgrounds that, that come from low income. Um, 
because I was writing about my family and my friends. Like when I started writing plays and, and people were like, oh, you're writing about these issues. And I was like, I guess, but I'm also writing just about the people I know. Um, so everything comes from a personal place for me of the stories of, of the people that I grew up with or that are my family. Um, and I started uh, writing this play um, in March, 2017. Uh, I was working on another play and, and um, into that play, uh, walked a dreamer character, which I wasn't expecting. Sometimes like people that, you know, you can make a plan of what this play is gonna be and, and you know, somebody completely unexpected will walk in and tell you what the play actually is. Uh, and um, that night I, I couldn't sleep. I was like three in the morning and I just kept like, um, certain memories kept kicking around in my head that night. Um, and uh, uh, particularly the stories of, of some people that I knew in high school. Um, and uh, so I got up that night um, and uh, started writing where I thought were like notes to myself um then I thought oh maybe this is a play and then I realized I was just writing the play and within three days the sort of the entirety of Sanctuary City kind of poured out um and I think I was trying to show what an impossible situation this is um particularly within the time that it, that it takes place in um uh I guess all my plays are kind of love letters for the for the people that I that I grew up with and this isn't, you know, this isn't any different. Uh, um, and so, yeah, I just wanna, I kind of wanted to invite people into the, into the world that I, that I know and experienced and get them to, to feel what it might be like to, to, um, yeah, to, to deal with some of the things that these characters were dealing with. Yeah. And we've lost all our panelists. There. <laughs> they all want to see us, why don't go first, man, lose them all. <laughs> and, and then they all disappear, they're all there. You're welcome <laughs> to be on screen with us. Um, it's, a, it's a dialogue amongst all of us. Oh, it's so much easier when there's fucking people. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't curse. <laughs> it's so much easier when there's people. No, like no worries, we know that that's the vernacular, <laughs> both of, of- That's true, of, you all saw the play, I mean. Of the play, <laughs> of the play which we appreciate tremendously. Um, uh, our audiences uh, uh, have loved the play, and I just wanted to to quickly uh, give a little bit of context. This is a production that we were in the midst of uh, uh, previews, and we were in the midst of previews uh, in March of 2020. Um, you know, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, a week or so from opening, um, and then the world came to a stop. And, um, and the set sat in the theater for over a year. And we're so lucky that we were able to bring back the production and then of course film it and been streaming it um, uh, for a couple of weeks uh, and um, actually more than that. And now, <laughs> and now we are, um, uh, the, the, the streaming ends this weekend. But I wonder if Martina, if you could talk a little bit about um, perhaps how, sort of the pandemic um, and the time away from the play, uh, you know, uh, shifted or not shifted, you're thinking about um, the piece and how it resonates um, with you personally and with audiences. I think probably when we came back, the, 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 the thing that I kept seeing throughout the, or what felt like most loud in the play to me was the way people care for one another particularly when they're in an environment and a world that doesn't want everyone to thrive on an equal level and the strain that that puts on relationships. Uh, and so I just like, I was highly attuned to how much these people, like are be, how much is being asked of these people and also how much they're giving, like how much care is in the, uh, it, like exists amongst them. And also like, but that's, um, you know, it can get thorny as we see in part two. Um, and then, uh, also like um uh it i think i i think i recognized that there was uh that that some of the characters like ha have become a little bit infected by this american mentality of like if you just work hard enough like it's going to be this promise that like if you just work hard enough like that's that's what will you know like you, you all be well when like there are so many obstacles stacked against certain people in certain situations that like uh um i always had a I had a difficult time with like the, the the concept of the american dream that it is not a level playing field uh and so like that just became more and more of, you know it was always there but became more more apparent um that there was also like not just that how difficult it is for these characters to maneuver the world but also that i think it's like be, become a part of their 
it, it is like comes through their mind where there's like there's almost an addiction to this idea of what is a successful American life, particularly for B. Um, uh, and maybe maybe G has like sacrificed a relationship because of her idea of that. Uh, and so that's that. Uh, yeah, that was something that was kind of an interesting surprise that there is that it partly is a story of also like the Amer what the American mentality, um, the American dream can cause you to like the, me the mental health issues that kind of like may emerge from it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Very quickly before I open for, um, you know, uh, our panelists to sort of share uh, uh, the responses to the piece uh, from their particular experiences in the communities that they work with. Um, for those that, um, of course, haven't seen the script of Sanctuary City or read the play because it's not published yet. Um, um, if they were to read the, the piece, they will, they will notice that there are no real <laughs> stage directions in the piece. Um, and in fact, the first part alone has over eight, 60, 80, 80, right? I was gonna say 80, 80, 86. The design right? team. <laughs> Flip the numbers. Um, <laughs> Um, um, and uh, that the, pr the production that, that you so capture uh, so brilliantly was directed by uh, Rebecca Frecknell. Um, and I wonder if you could speak about that relationship of, of, of sort of creating along with Rebecca, this um, visual um, world that this, this, this play inhabits. It was truly like everybody, it was a collaborative experience all across the board, like the, um, uh, what's awesome about Rebecca is that she doesn't like pretend to know more than she does and like just isn't is not a good bullshitter uh, and so she was like what does it look like to be standing at like I don't know how to stage this play let's look let's all just be in conversation with one another and like um, what is it what does it mean to be standing outside a window uh, and then we had the actors just use the actors basically created a choreography the entire part part one was their impulses and we kind of we, we sculpted the play around around them uh, and we had our sound designer and our, and our lighting designer that we were in conversation with, like we would, we would uh, work 10, 10 pages of the play, record it and like send it to them so they can, they can be constantly thinking about it and giving us like sound and, and lighting ideas. And um, I, like when I write a play, I know I, like, th this is why I don't write fiction because I don't have the best ideas. Like if I, like I, I really thrive on being in conversation with other people. Like I have a, I have a play that is a hypothesis with full of questions and I wanna bring it to other people so we can be in conversation about like what is true and how can we like most elevate the thing that is like the deepest truth within it based on a lot of other people's circumstances. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I, so I keep cursing, man. It's just like, I fucking thrive on that. I listen. So, so I was, I mean, I also had to be back in the, in the rehearsal room, back in the theater. Uh, Cause it really was like, it just was, was a, you know, a return, a return to that of just making together. So it was really, you know, it was really a collaborative, collaborative work of, of everyone's love. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's a beautiful production, and I think the intimacy I think really conveys the story and both the interior uh, experience of these characters um, and also the isolation. So I think it's just you, you did a phenomenal job, and we're so so proud of the production. I I want to open it up to anyone. Uh, 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 really, your responses to the piece, the things that resonate with you, and and. Um, um, perhaps in your experience, from, again, as I said, the communities you work with, um, you all work with immigrant communities. Um, um, and it, this is really important to, to you, all of you. So feel free to unmute and, and, and share. Martina, you were, um, sorry, you were talking a little bit about, you know, the, almost like the fallacy of the American dream, right? You know, and, and, and that it's not the equal playing field. And I think that, you know, we've, uh, we've kind of savored this narrative of the U.S. as an immigrant nation, but then um, sort of historically, when you look and unpack that, it's not necessarily the welcoming <laughs> immigrant nation <laughs> um, that uh, that I that I think we want the story to be right, like that we want the the sort of the branding, the packaging <laughs> to be. And you know what I found so fascinating about this is you know it, was, it wasn't even just about dreams unrealized, but also you know who is allowed to dream, right? Um, and you know that is. Uh, 
for me, I think re watching it, the other, the other thing that came out is that the time period that it was set, right? Like, you know, and, and for us at Raices, we actually last year released an eight part podcast on the history of um, the Department of Homeland Security. And so we called, like you'd say, it was called Homeland Insecurity. And basically, how in the aftermath of September 11th, you have, um, you know, DHS being formed and how essentially people that, you know, the enemy went from being people looking like sort of me, essentially, like I'm the, yeah, I'm the Iraqi Muslim male um, to all immigrants becoming the enemy, right? Like, and so that's why that, that, that 2001 <laughs> sort of anchoring um, was very, it hit me in particular. Um, but I was wondering a little bit more if you could, like, why did you choose to set it in that moment? Like what provoked you um, to, to start there? <laughs> you think he's, yeah, you see. Oh my God, this podcast sounds amazing and also um, probably horrendously heartbreaking. Um, the, it was the time period that I, that I was, that was my age in 2000, in 2001. And it was, you know, we'd like watch the towers fall from, a, from across the water um, over in Jersey and like had our school locked down. And, uh, and then all, so, sort of all of a sudden my, my friends got real nervous uh, and um, uh, it was, it was like, um, people were, were, were returning were returning to their countries of origin like there was um you know, people were you know leaving being taken away uh and um i i instead of setting it in the present i wanted to i wanted to bring the people's lives like those people who, who grew up during then are like in their 30s and so like, if you, so like that, like the, the BG are in their, are in their thirties. And this is like, these were the obstacles that were against them. And it is an entire human life. I mean, if, if you are, if you are at the cusp of your adulthood uh, and 9-11 happens, it is, and as well as like, you know, before the Marriage Equality Act, uh, like that is, these are people's lives who, that have like, have, that have like had to hit against obstacles after obstacles. And like, and not just like for the for the opportunities that they have access to, but but like what is that doing to their brain and their souls and their hearts? Um, to feel have this feeling of like you don't belong here, you're unwelcome, you're unwanted, uh, and to live with that for the rest of their their life, even even as policy is, has changed, um, those lives have still been spent in the same way. Uh, and so I, so I like wanted to put it during 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 that time to show how impossible and how difficult that um like what what that policy did did to human lives during that time so I'm, I'm glad that you um that you just discussed right now marriage equality so to me when when i saw the play a few weeks ago um with anju actually um what stood out to me was the role that marriage plays it's played in immigration law and this as you said it was before marriage equality and what I kept thinking about was that how marriage is a savior, but also a barrier. Marriage played a role in helping G's mother, right? Um, get some, um, um, get regularized. But at the same time, later on, when we see how B and G were, were struggling with their friendship and what to do, we friendship is not a basis for petitioning someone, sponsoring someone for uh, to become, uh, to, to cross over, to become documented. And that's a critique of marriage and the role that marriage plays. And it should be a critique. Why is it that only certain relationships are privileged in marriage, you know, mar um, or in, in immigration law, spouses, parents and children, um, but not grandparents and, and grandchildren, right? Not uncles and aunts. And so there are some family relationships that are just not um, included, but then also these kinds of close relationships that we see and, and so what kept standing out to me was uh, marriage and how, although this was pre-marriage equality, marriage equality fixed that, it still doesn't address, uh, immigration law does not address these other forms of family through friendships. So I just wondered what you might think about um, that critique of immigration law. Yeah, it's another like, you have the, like you have to fight for, uh... To be considered equal, to be considered equal, like again, it's just not like uh, uh, you have to fit into very specific 
uh, terms that are that are decided by some by by people who, for, for the most part, probably had no experience with you know in li living living this this way, and and um, uh, is just an additional yeah, it's an additional barrier. I mean, like the the B and G is in a sense become each other's like family. They become each other's makeshift sort of chosen family, and like that's a that's a you know that's a I think a common uh, experience, right? Of like you come to you come to uh, America, and like your best friends might not be like from your community. Like my like my my mother, um, you know, when we first came, we were we were um, we were sponsored over, and then um, uh, or we were, we were invited over. Um, and uh, she ended up being in, a, in an abusive relationship. And but like everybody who was in her community were his friends, and so then like her support system basically crumbled because like there was there were sides being taken, and so like she you know she had to leave that she had to leave that community. She was sort of thrown out of that community and had to like you know make make different families, make different friends outside. You know like that. that um, uh, but yeah, basically, yes. I mean, I feel like I'm I'm also going to just keep talking about like personal things. So I'm really interested in like people who actually know <laughs> the policy about but behind this. Um, but yeah, I've seen. I, I feel like it's unfair. And I've seen. I've seen that happen to a lot of. Yeah. Various. And then of course the the place said before DACA as well, right? And so and so I wonder if folks can can continue to sort of speak about the things that sort of resonated with them and perhaps. Um, you know, the moment we're in, I mean, I think as Rose was saying, you know, uh, things have changed and have not changed in terms of, of, of the, the sort of the struggle, you know, towards a path towards immigration reform. And I wonder if folks can speak to that. I, I oh, sorry, what? I wanted to comment that it was painfully refreshing that all of G's problems weren't solved when she had when she acquired lawful status. Um, you know, I came from, you know, way before I became an attorney, I came from an activist sphere here in New Jersey with young people that mobilized to pass legislation that would help undocumented youth in our home state. And that same cohort, it's been such a celebration, you know, when some of my peers have updated their Instagram or Facebook posts and they, you know, they're there with the American flag and their certificate of naturalization, you know, with their A number blocked out for privacy. And it's great, but the trauma of being undocumented doesn't go away, right? It's, it's frightening. Um, how so much of that just never leaves you. You know, you still kind of look behind your back. You might kind of clench up a little bit when you get in the airport or near, near the airport. Um, and that constant doubt of maybe this isn't permanent. Um, I thought it was very important that you added that as part of the narrative and the storyline. Um, I appreciate that. And Alex, you mentioned DACA. I have DACA and I can state and describe the advantages and benefits it has provided me. But at the same time, it's very overblown, right? I worked without authorization. I paid my way through college, paying out of state tuition before DACA. The only real benefit now to me having DACA isn't even my law license. Um, it's for me right now, personally, I can travel on advanced parole and finally take my dad's ashes back to his home country. But the fact that I even have to pay the government a couple hundred dollars to be afforded this very human right of putting my dad's remains to rest was heartbreaking. The fact that I know that in advance that when I fly in and I have to go through customs, which I have never had to do in my conscience life, terrifies me. You know, I have a law degree. I am a somewhat, you know, I have a, I have a public presence. And even then still, still, I feel fear. Um, I thought it was incredibly important, Martina, for you 
to capture that so beautifully. Um, so thank you for, for doing that. I think it's very easy in other mediums to kind of gloss over. Um, that just constant instability and that having become a naturalized citizen or even having a lawful permanent residency doesn't fix that. And it doesn't fix all these other internalized uh, misconceptions about what success is and how we define our life and how we can truly be happy. So thank you. Thank you. There's the, what you mentioned too about school, I mean, paying your way through school, like, you know, G is gonna have like a, a degree, but like you said, like at what cost, like to her soul and like, you know, if B pursues that route as well, like there's still now more barriers, like not, you know, the actual tangible barriers, not, you know, not even including the things that are happening emotionally and, you know, within one's soul that like, uh, I had, had written another, another play where a character um, goes to Princeton and ends up, um, who's also a first gen character who ends up um, sleeping in her car because her mother um, uh, uh, becomes sick and has to return to her home country where she can get where she can have more family care for her um, with a debilitating um, disease and audiences kept being like what do you mean she's sleeping in her car I don't believe she went to Princeton and I was like I don't know I like there's not there wasn't enough time in the play to like convince you that poverty is real <laughs> like, that these things like it doesn't fix it it doesn't it doesn't make up for the you know it, yeah you have a degree but the the, the the obstacles continue and so I uh, thank you <laughs> thank you feel feel validated and, as well. and, <laughs> and Martina is being modest because this this place cost of living uh right Martina is this is this cost of living if I remember correctly Pulitzer yeah. Prize winning cost of living <laughs> they're um, way more they're way more fancy doing way more important things than, than like winning a Pulitzer like <laughs> to you all actually um um Andrew you were going to you were going to say as well yeah I'm not, so 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 sorry I don't want to interrupt Andrew but one of the things that Marisol um sort of touched on not just as in DACA being overblown because I could talk for days about that. It's an, it's an IOU for deportation as well. Like, I mean, it's just like the, it is, it, it, it was a stopgap measure um, that ever since it started, both, you know, political parties have not done anything to reinforce it really at the end of the day and may actually, you know, further <laughs> destabilize it. Um, so like that is a, uh, Everyone always wants to present DACA as like, oh, here was the solution. And basically it's just saying, oh yeah, no, unless we, <laughs> unless we, you know, we won't go out of our way to find you essentially. And hey, you can have a driver's license in some states and go, you know, and work. Um, and I think that so much of the immigration system just sort of degrades um, our humanity. And I think what Marisol touched on as well was really the, not just that all of the problems weren't solved for G, but it was just like, it was the multi-generational trauma for immigrant families um, is just profound. And immigration itself is just sort of like all the principles of it are, are it's rooted in these concepts of family separation because it's to denigrate, it's to, it is to destabilize, it is to make you give up. <laughs> and then, uh, and then a lot of the fears that end up manifesting and sort of almost metastasizing get passed on to your children and your children's children. Um, and that's something that we don't talk about a lot. And I, what I hate about the immigration sort of conversation is that it's just more about like, oh, people just want to come here. And then people then want like, you know, sort of the great American dream life and they got here and then, you know, they're just riding high. <laughs> and what we're talking about at the end of the day is that people are seeking human, basic human rights of security, safety, you know, freedoms. But the immigration system doesn't ever actually even give you those freedoms, even if you get your papers, <laughs> like, because then you are in this sort of mental, emotional, um, you know, prison. Um, so I just really wanted to thank you, Marisol, for calling that out. Um, and sorry, Andrew, sorry. <laughs> No, I'm actually relieved because it's really hard to follow Marisol mm -hmm. and I've had to, this isn't the first time I've had to follow you, Marisol, in a speaking engagement. <laughs> and, um, so, yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, for me, what really resonated with me that I think the, the 
the play really brought forth was this, um, the kind of cycles of like hope and hopelessness that we go through and that we have gone through over time. Um, I actually started representing um, immigrants right after 9-11. Um, so kind of from the other side, right? At, you know, having those, those same um, sort of feelings of hope and hopelessness from the, from the representative's perspective, right? So um, one of the, I thought, most poignant moments of the play was when it, it was in part two where G was kind of yelling and, 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 and I'm sorry if I'm getting this wrong because I saw the play a few weeks ago, but when she was saying, you know, this is never going to happen for you. You're never, you're never going to be able to, uh, you know, get status based on your same-sex marriage um, or, you know, what, again, I'm not the playwright. So, um, so sorry for the paraphrase, but I just thought that was so powerful because of course we all know, right, with the benefit of hindsight, what, what did end up happening there. Um, but in the moment, it just feels so hope hopeless, right? And in, until 2008, it, it did, you know, and then, and then there was some hope um, for, uh, you know, dreamers and for, um, you know, some, right, not, not total, for some people, there was some hope, right, for some dreamers, for some um, LGBT individuals, right, for some other immigrants. Um, and then, as we know, you know, four years of, of you know, beyond hopelessness, right, that, that we all um, kind of lived through, and, and now some hope, then there was some hope again, and, and, and some disappointment again, right, so I just, um, that to me was um, really struck me about that, the play, and how you just kind of captured that feeling of when you're in one of those moments of hopelessness, depending on what's going on in our national conversation, it feels like it's going to last forever, um, so I don't know if there's a question in there, but I just wanted to say that. Well, this is the thing too with, with like, somebody came up to me after a play and they were like, oh man, if you just waited one more year. And I was like, nah, man, second term. That was Obama's second term. And so then it was like, it's, you know, add, add, add more years onto that as well of like still waiting and maybe, maybe it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't, wasn't sort of even accomplished then. And like, maybe the feeling that like, I, I, <laughs> I mean, at one point, a few few years ago, within this last administration, like my mom was like, "Will they take Will they take my citizenship away? Could that happen?" And we were like, "Maybe. We don't know. Like, maybe anything's possible. Like that there is potentially this feeling that like anything that is that like you're you're given can at any point be taken be taken away." Thank you. Honestly, um, I don't uh, know if I could have even watched it or got, made it through it if I were watching it during the Trump administration. So um, in some ways, I'm glad that I that I watched it, you know, a year and a half after I was intended to <laughs> to watch it. Tim, I wanted to 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 uh, to bring you in. And I know you, you you are an artist as well. And 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 uh, Marisol's story, obviously, it's it's powerful, and and um, stories can be very powerful to to perhaps help us build coalitions and and and, and move movements forward. I wonder if you could sort of share, and I know that you do some work collecting stories. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Multimedia stories about um, perhaps the immigrant experience and beyond. But anyway, just to share your impressions about the piece and perhaps the role of storytelling and the arts and in in, in this work as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I'd like to say is that Martina is wrong. Um, in fact, the work that she does is, um, is, is at least as important as anybody who's working as a lawyer or an activist or an advocate. This is something that I, I, I felt so deeply during the pandemic um, that my friends who do that kind of work, uh, <laughs> I mean, I straddle both worlds, but, one, but those who are deeply in it, like Marisol, Anjou, Rose, uh, they have said to me on numerous occasions, like, Art and artists are, in fact, what gives them a sense of possibility, a sense of hope, a sense that that um, there is something beyond the sort of horror of the present immigration uh, policies and enforcement. And I, 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 I mean, I, I've been. I, I first became aware of um, Martinez's work with Ironbound, and um, it was particularly resonant to me for a few reasons. One, I live in the Ironbound section of Newark. Um, to um, it, those characters were so familiar and and and, and so deeply like um, recognizable um, in a way that clearly signaled to me that she was an insider, um, and she of course grew up across the river in Carney, um, and 
with Sanctuary City, um, she's telling the story of so many of, of our students at Rutgers Newark. Um, and uh, there's a sense that I had, and I, I look forward to having this conversation with Marisol later, because I haven't had a chance to talk to her about the play. Because Marisol is the person who first brought me to, um, to this range of issues and experiences, and it has become a big part of my life since. Um, and I, 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 I take, um, one of the things I took away from Sanctuary City is, is that I finally saw in a work of literature, uh, and I, you know, I read novels, I read <laughs> a range of literature. Um, it was the first time that I had really was hearing the kind of social and psychological uh, experiences that my students had been telling me for years. Um, the stories were, were not only familiar, but the way in which they got at um, things that Marisol and others had shared with me um, over the years felt so important to put out into the world. Um, and I certainly feel that storytelling at this moment um, is critically important uh, in, in a wide variety of ways, but not the least of which is that one project that we ran during the pandemic was a, a, a project called Stories from the Pandemic, where we worked with high school and college students to become frontline reporters in their homes, neighborhoods, communities to, to, to document the impact of the pandemic, mostly on uh, young people of color, the vast majority of whom were immigrants, many of whom were undocumented. And one of the things that, that seemed true across the board is they all found some form of art that was critical to their self-care in that moment. And um, so again, I just want to, <laughs> coming full circle, Martina, you're wrong. The work you're doing is critically important. It's hugely, hugely. When you have a voice like yours, when you have a gift like yours, don't underestimate it, please, in any way. Thank you, and I feel deeply uncomfortable by kindness, which could probably be my immigrant background as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. <laughs> Thank you for the kindness. Yeah, no, uh, Raiz is echoing what Tim says. We always say, like, you know, in, in the creative partnerships that we engage in, you know, one of the like sort of the lead statements that we always make is that the law is downstream from culture. And so this is the storytelling um, that is so necessary um, because that is what engages, educates, humanizes, moves public opinion because law and policy is not going to change until the public demands it. And, and so that is, that is why work like yours is, is so necessary and, and, and profound. Um, and, and, and it's, it's critical in the fight for, for migrant justice. I can just say from, from, from Raices perspective. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, can we get, like for the, for anybody who is listening, who is like, who is, an, an, who is an artist or a writer, like I, I started writing because I didn't uh, understand. I, I wanted to understand more of these sort of feelings that I had that I that was that like through survival it was like don't look at this, um, and I felt deeply alone. And like through writing and through being in a, in in community with other artists and being in conversation, like I felt um, like I could become a fuller human being. Um, like writing is very difficult. I hate it. I'll do it so that I can get this feeling <laughs> uh, of of kind of belonging and being okay and being less alone. And so like. Um, even though I'm like, oh, it doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean anything, actually, like, I just want to encourage anybody who is listening that, like, there's, there isn't, there is an audience who does truly care about your, your stories, if you have these sorts of stories to share, and, and, um, uh, and I hope that you, that you tell them, anybody who's out there, who's, who's, um, yeah, you all have stories to tell, but I encourage you to tell them. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh... And I want to take this moment to say that at New York City Workshop, we, we have a, a program in partnership with PEN America. It's a program called Dreaming Out Loud that, um, and we provide a, you know, we do a playwriting seminar for folks that are um, immigrants undocumented. So we work with CUNY students um, um, and, um, and, and give them space to develop their plays and then bring actors to, to read those pieces. And it's been really meaningful space for all of us. Um, I wonder if folks could, could talk about the moment we find ourselves in now, perhaps politically, <laughs> legally, um, uh, as Andrew was saying, the sort of the, the, 
the, the moment of hope and hopelessness and perhaps um, what are things that we should be looking at and um, perhaps signal boosting and sort of paying attention to and, and throwing our support behind in this moment as we continue in, in the fight. Well, um, so I have to be honest that I'm, I'm very disappointed right now. I had to go back to a theme that Anju brought up hope. I was so full of hope after uh, President Biden was declared the president. And um, it's, it's interesting, it, was a, it actually happened on the day that we were doing a virtual citizenship clinic and the pro bono lawyers and I just started crying in front of clients, which was kind of embarrassing, but they understood that what it meant for, at least for the work that we were doing. And then here we are, November, 2021, and we don't know what's going on with DACA. Right. Um, what's happening at the border is just um, immoral, and um, I'm I'm so I'm disappointed um, that I had hoped that racial justice could be centered in immigration law, and maybe that was too much to expect or to hope for, um, but and it didn't happen, and so that's where I am. I'm I'm angry with where we are, and um, and part of that is because I feel that. You know, there, we now I have we all have friends who now are working for President Biden, and um, and it just seems as if the the kind of work that I thought would happen by now is not happening, and it's getting tied up in so much um, debate and and policy discussions. And meanwhile, there are people whose lives are at stake. They are still separated from their families. People are still living in the shadows. And what, you know, why is that happening now? What's going to happen next year? And so I'm trying not to be hopeless, but it's just where I'm at at this moment. That's where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm angry. I'm upset. And, and I, I would like to feel better about where we are. And I'd like to know what I can do about it. That was depressing. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm totally with you there. Like, I think that's the same is that we'd, um, we'd had hope as well. I'd had hope. I speak for myself, but, and I think part of it's still like, you know, it, there's an Arabic saying that when you've seen death, you're cool with a fever. And I think that was <laughs> like, you know, like, it was like, it was like, well, like the, the last administration was something just was, um, was just of another level, just in terms of the uh, the the rhetoric and the 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 demonization of immigrants. Um, and words matter. I mean, especially we're talking here about a play. Like words matter. And um, but you know what's happening right now? I I would have thought that like a couple of easy wins. Like I mean, Title Forty Two still isn't rescinded. <laughs> like. And, you know, and what you touched on as well, um, Rose, is the, is, is, is the racial injustice that is also embedded within, within immigration, right? So you have those, the darker your skin is, the, you know, the, the worse off it is for you. Um, you know, for us, when we pay out bonds at Raices, our Haitian um, migrants, 54% higher than the average bond rate that we pay out, 54% higher. Um, right now, you know, we saw the images at the, uh, you know, at the border of the Haitians in September, right? And it, them being returned to Haiti <laughs> in the midst of economic <laughs> and political <laughs> and you know, uh, environmental disaster mm. that there are, you know, the American government is saying that any of their own citizens should get out of Haiti ASAP right now. And yet we are still doing plane, taking planes back and dropping people off there. <laughs> um, you know, so, I mean, I think that the, the fact of the matter is, is that there are so many of these policies that are still in place right now. I mean, even when we accept like even when we accept unaccompanied children in this nation, right? Like unaccompanied children, it was in the headlines, the news cared about it for a few news cycles in April, May, still going on. <laughs> in a year, about 130,000 unaccompanied children, primarily from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, 
as young as two years old, being put into prisons. <laughs> like everyone wants to like, there are these nice words that we put around things like shelters, like, oh, not arrested. They're, you know, apprehended and, you know, in government custody. But these young children are in squalid conditions on top of each other under this administration right now for an average of a month, it's still going on. And so I think one of the biggest things that we have to worry about is complacency because yes, we breathe, you know, we all breathed a little bit of a sigh of relief when the, you know, when Biden and Harris were elected, but the problem is, is that so many, including the public, and again, when we just said it's like the public is what's going to drive change, just sort of we're like, oh, okay, cool, everything must be okay. Well, no, I mean, everything is, I'll, you know, I'll join you in some, you know, in level of Martina of like cursing, like <laughs> it's still craptastic. <laughs> and I think the problem is, is that we just don't want to, but we're not paying attention to it as a, you know, as a, as a public. Um, we're not calling it out. We're not demanding better. And, and I think that that is, um, that's the greatest risk um, that we face right now, like uh, falling asleep at the wheel. Thank you. If I may mention that the it, 2016 to 2020 weren't the worst years to be an immigrant, even 2001, wasn't the worst year to be an immigrant in the United States. It was, it has always been a terrible time to be an immigrant in the United States. Some of the first immigrants to the United States were forced to be here against their own will. And I have a very deep suspicion that our American capitalism thrives off of the exploitation of work. That was the very foundation for our government and this country, and it continues to be the case. We don't have to do more than look at the last 12, 18 months to verify that. How many of the deceased who died because of COVID or COVID-related complications were folks who did not get to benefit from any kind of these social safety nets. No unemployment compensation, no stimulus check to any filer that had a relative that paid taxes with an individual taxpayer identification number. Um, but still people want other people to work for the least amount of that could be possible to be given to a human and then still have the audacity to say, well, they don't, some people just don't want to work. You know, it's, it's been incredibly frustrating. Um, it's not, I can't say that I'm disappointed because I think I'm just used to this, sorry, shitty situation that it has been and that it, that it is. But the things that we have now, I think that generally, Americans were really quick to forget because it's unpleasant, but the really crappy things that we have were passed by a democratic, were signed into law by a democratic president under a Republican Congress in 1996. Mandatory detention, 1996. Three and 10 year bars after you know, unlawfully being in the United States for more than one year, 1996. You know, the very reason why so many parents of US citizen minor children don't have a clear cut path to towards lawful permanent residency isn't because they don't have a family member that can petition for them. It's some of these onerous bars that were put in place that effectively helped create a class of people that are whoever that are forever going to be undocumented, right? And who does that actually benefit? It benefits the employers, right? It benefits people who don't want to pay a living wage, that don't want to provide benefits that are going to help people just not suffer. I mean, no one, I don't think anyone is expecting any handouts, right? But just that basic thing of having reliable shelter, 
maybe even a landlord who's reasonable and doesn't threaten you if you just don't accept the squalid conditions of the place you're being leased. Um, it's all terrible. But I, what I would want other people to take away is that I don't know when it happens, but it's not the executive that gets to fix everything. And I think DACA was problematic in that it did kind of help bolster that illusion that one president can do whatever he or she wants with respect to immigration policy. That's not how that works, right? Like Faisal said, law and policy only changes when the people demand it and people haven't demanded much. And if there is anything that we can take from the last 18 months of this global pandemic is that I think more people are starting to get fed up with the system because it's not just affecting, you know, who may perceive to be vulnerable, but it's affecting common everyday people. Um, and it's that anger, it's that discomfort that has always driven what some may perceive as like radical social change. I think that time is now. So how do we all collectively tap into that anger and start actually flexing our muscles of democracy? Let's actually use it the way it was intended to be. I just Thank threw a, a Sorry, I, I just threw a link into the chat that supports what Marisol was saying. This is a story that, um, that the Newest Americans Project that I direct covered during the pandemic. And it, 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 is about the, um, it is about the exploitation of undocumented workers in Freehold, New Jersey, which um, is Bruce Springsteen's hometown. In fact, it's the subject of my hometown. Um, and it, it's, um, it's a town that is a, a gathering point for all the contractors in the, in the region to pick up uh, inexpensive undocumented labor. And because the US government didn't provide any support for people who were undocumented during the pandemic, those workers had to continue working throughout the pandemic. Many of them got sick, many died. Um, the inequities are very clear. What, what, the, um, what the piece I think does a really terrific job of showing is that this is a, this is a town in central New Jersey that essentially has been uh, 40 years ago, it was, an, it was essentially African-American sharecroppers who were working the agricultural lands in the region. Um, and they now have been replaced by, um, by Mexican and Central Americans who, um, again, are, are, are not afforded any of the rights or protections. Uh, and the pandemic really exacerbated this, the, these inequities. Um, and it, it, I mean, the ultimate irony is that this is, this is, again, it's Bruce Springsteen's hometown, the town that he's, sings about falling apart in the 1960s as he's leaving because of deindustrialization and the squashing of unions. So it's a place that in many ways reflects, I think, uh, the ways in which American capitalism and the ways in which uh, American democracy are racialized and dependent upon the labor um, and the vulnerability of populations that are not afforded uh, the rights and respect of citizens. Um, and, and so again, I, I do think we've come in the pandemic, um, I mean, this has been written about a lot, that, 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 that it's exacerbated all these inequities. I hope um, that we're, we've reached a point where we're angry enough to say enough. I'm not convinced. Um, I think at least politically, there seems to be very little will. Um, immigration is still the third, the third rail of American politics. Um, I think it's going to be up to the kind of advocates um, and activists that I have gotten to know over the years at, at Rutgers Newark, the students who, who, for whom the battle is very personal, the lawyers who, uh, like Rose and Anju, who have been, you know, um, kind of <laughs> endlessly engaged at the People's Law School, as we like to call uh, the Rutgers Law School, um, and others who, who are are fighting on a regular basis, but I, I don't see a major groundswell of popular support and opinion. I just don't see it. I, I wish I did. I wish I wasn't so cynical about it, but I am at the moment. And if I may, as, as we head into an election year and the midterms, it seems that othering and um, racist politics uh, seems to be galvanizing a lot of people in this country, unfortunately. So, so scapegoating. Um, continues so it's a it's a, it's a, it's a uh, we hear your call for 
anger and, and movement. So um, we're running out of time and I just want to remind folks that if you have any questions and you would like to uh, share them with us through the Q&A uh, feature, um, we'll take a couple of those. Um, uh, there's a, a question for you, Martina, in the Q&A feature about, um, you know, you really worked on the play for a long time and um, Joel is, uh, is asking if um, there were any technical elements of this production that made you see the play in a different way. Did, you, did the inclusion of any tech or the set uh, make you change the script in any way? I think uh, they saw the workshop at New York stage um, in film uh, and were uh, immediately moved by the sound design. But um, yeah, anything that you, you changed along the way um, just, I think I just trimmed it to make it seem like um, to to like high, to highlight the like the, the the kind of most potent arguments like from that time most of it has been like expanding and then trimming for what's essential but like I don't know if this play's gonna work because I was like it's eighty seven scenes I don't know if it's gonna if you're gonna sit through it again what the fuck's going on so so like by like week one of rehearsal I was like oh good oh good we have like lovely collaborators who can who who I think are the same, like who are aesthetically um, like very much uh, in, in line with like what we're hoping to do. So it was again, a, like gratitude to the collaborators who like helped make it, helped, helped make it live basically. But yeah, every day, so then learn something new and then change it and try to make it better. Any re other remaining thoughts from our panelists about um, the play? Um, uh, any particular work that you're doing at your um, organizations that uh, that you want to highlight or um, uh, direct our attention to? Um, feel free to to share those. We we happy to hear. I I'd just like to say that on behalf of all of us in Newark, um, we would love Martina to come and work with us on something. <laughs> yes, please, because they didn't call me back. So yes, happily, <laughs> we'll go to Adega. It'll be great. <laughs> also, my since now I have my platform, like tell your stories, tell your angry, heartfelt, fucking full, full of your soul stories out there, people. <laughs> love, I love. Them. I want to see them. I'm just really curious as to what you're working on right now. Um, if if there are things that you can talk about. Me with all these like cool panelists we talked about. <laughs> like, what they're working on. I'm trying to I'm trying to make Sanctuary City into a series right now because I want it. I want people to have more people to have access to it in ways that I think you know theater is beautiful and lovely as it is to to like it's it's also limiting geographically and sometimes you know it's financially limiting, and so I'd like to. I'd like to share the story like with more time and with more with more people and then also some musicals. Cause I like musicals. Uh, <laughs> so I'm writing a film um, right now and and um, yeah, trying to get my health insurance through TV and film. <laughs> All immigrant stories. <laughs> uh, Martina, can I ask you about your choice to call it Sanctuary City? Because so um, it, it, the term Sanctuary City is such a political term. And so I can see why that's intentional and in, in from that, if that's what you were trying to do. Um, but part of what, um, as, as advocates and as lawyers, we try to convince the other side. And so I, and I actually write on sanctuary and I use that term in my writing, but there's a political cost to it in that I turn people off. So I'm, I'm wondering your thoughts about, I'd like to hear your choice of using Sanctuary City to name your play. I usually have a really hard time naming plays because I don't want to define what it what it tends to be. So like with my play Ironbound and Queens, I just tend to write like like the set here. Um, and so, but this one was a was one of the fastest titles, um, and I think it became. Um, sanct I think that these two characters are each other's sanctuary for like they are. Uh, we talked about the beginning of the play feeling sort of like. Um, 
like a snow globe. It's the two of them and they have made their own worlds that like, and, and have protected one another as best as they can. Like even um, the lighting and, uh, and the stage tried to keep them in a very close spot as though like that was the, their, their part. And part of it is fantasy. I mean, they're living like spouses. They're living like siblings as well. Like it's like living with you, finding your person and that, and that feeling of sanctuary is kind of what, it, so it came out of a poetic, realization that I, uh, that I, um, and then obviously New York being a sanctuary city, but I was like, I liked the double meaning um, uh, of, of, of that term. And I, I also just find it beautiful if it was a concept that actually um, fulfilled its promise. <laughs> yeah. I don't think any of us are, are, are interested in shilling our work. Uh, we just have really, really appreciated being, uh, being a part of this and, and, and getting a chance to see the play um, uh, and really hope um, that if this is a series that it gets out there, uh, that not only does it get you health insurance and, and, uh, but that it actually gets, a, gets an audience. Um, because I do feel right now that TV um, uh, is a place where maybe uh, the conversation moves to where the law ultimately and politics ultimately will go. And um, I do think often in this country that uh, law and political change follow cultural change. And so um, more power to you. I hope, it, I hope it's out. I hope, I hope it's seen by millions and millions of people and changes the story. I hope it does for, for undocumented issues what Dick Cheney did for gay marriage, which I am sorry, I, that's that's a horrible thing. I, I just think it's ironic that that really what brings about gay marriage probably more than any single thing was Dick Cheney coming out in support because of his daughter, which to me is the ultimate irony of how things get done in the United States. Anyway, it's a more complicated than story than that I know, but just so called political center. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, uh, well, thank you all so very much. It's been a pleasure. Time is our oppressor tonight. Um, and uh, I, I, I know we could continue um, in conversation about um, uh, the play and, um, and, and, all, and all of the issues that it raises uh, for all of you in your work. Um, so I appreciate all of your time. Um, uh, thank you to our audience for uh, um, uh, joining us tonight and for uh, streaming the play. Um, there's still time to see it until uh, the 21st. So um, share um, information. Um, um, you can buy streaming passes at nytw.org um, and, um, and share this uh, powerful story and Martina's work. Thank you all so very much for joining us tonight. Um, any final words before we say goodbye? Thank you again, Martina because artistry is the only thing that I think gives humanity an ounce of joy um, amidst whatever life could throw at us collectively, individually. So thank you for putting your heart out there, for centering the lives of people that you care about. Thank you. Oh my God, I cry, I love you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Martina. Thank you. And thank you all for the work you do. Um, um, See you next time. Thank you, everyone.